The thoughts of others were light and fleeting, of lovers meeting, or luck or fame. Mine were of trouble. This memoir's author, Peter Kemp, has arrived in Spain. He claims to have come here to report on the war, but that's just his cover. His true mission is to fight in it. To fight for the nationalists. But he must decide which faction of nationalists to enlist under. The nationalist rebels were divided into many factions. The Falange accepted foreigners, but Kemp was no fascist. The International Brigade was relatively neutral politically, but it enforced strict discipline, and Kemp didn't speak any Spanish yet. And finally, there were the Carlist Recates, who were fighting over a century-old succession dispute, specifically to ban women from the Spanish throne. Very based. Kemp thinks over his options, carefully considering which faction best aligns with his goals and values. Eventually, he comes to a decision. On the other side of Spain, George Orwell arrives in Catalonia. He claims in his memoir to have actually come to work as a journalist, but personally, I don't believe him. Pretty much as soon as he gets off the boat, Orwell gets swept up in a revolutionary fervor and signs up to join the first radical communist militia he can find, the POUM. Naturally, he does this without giving any thought as to what long-term consequences this might have for him. And oh boy, is it gonna have some consequences. These are the memoirs of two men who left the safety and comfort of England to fight in Spain. One for the nationalists, and the other for the communists. They were volunteers, idealists, mercenaries. You can call me Ezekiel. This is homage to Catalonia versus mine were of trouble. Let's jump in! During his time in Spain, Peter Kemp fought for two different units. First were the Recetes, the military arm of the Carlists. He chose them because he saw a real romance in fighting alongside men who carried on a royalist struggle for over a hundred years. Especially since it was against women. After gaining experience and improving his Spanish, Kemp went on to serve as an officer in the elite International Brigade. Which, contrary to what its name would suggest, was made up of around 90% Spaniards. This was the unit with the famous slogan, Viva la Muerte, Long Live Death. They weren't all talk either. The soldiers of the Legion would frequently find themselves fighting to the death in last stands of incredible heroism. Kemp participated in a few himself, nearly dying many times. Whereas Kemp fought valiantly alongside the best soldiers the Nationalists had to offer, Orwell fought alongside children. A lot of the soldiers in his POUM militia were teenagers, who only joined the militia to get food for themselves and their families. As you would expect, they were inadequately trained and poorly equipped. Orwell complains about this a lot. It's almost like he should have researched the organization before joining it. As a result, Orwell didn't get to see much fighting. His unit was only used to man defensive positions along unimportant parts of the front, and as bait. This was also a source of great disappointment to Orwell. The small bits of fighting he did see were so ridiculous as to seem comical. His unit was once ordered to perform a night raid against an enemy trench. Since they didn't have any proper uniforms, they were supposed to be issued with white armbands so they could identify each other. But the supply situation was so bad that they couldn't even manage that. So a new, genius solution was thought up. they just not shoot their guns, and instead only use bayonets. Although they would soften up the enemy trench with bombs and gunfire before entry. But shooting at any point after that would be suicidal, since that would cause your own squad to think you're the enemy, and attempt to shank you. After reaching the enemy trench, and the initial fusillade of gunfire and bombs, Orwell jumped in, and found an enemy soldier. Orwell lunged at the man, missed, and then chased him down a communication trench, trying to stab him the whole way. After failing to shank a stranger, he joined his unit looting the trench. But as it turned out, their enemies were just as poorly supplied as they were. They seized what few valuables they could find, got reinforced by four men from a different unit that took a wrong turn and got slaughtered, and finally scurried back to their own trench. Orwell later found out that in spite of the casualties and lack of loot, the operation was a success. It turned out that their real mission was to divert the Nationalists away from another part of the front. They actually managed to distract between 200 and 600 Nationalist troops. Good job, child soldiers! Meanwhile, Kemp got to see a lot more fighting, and usually performed a way more useful role than bait. Sometimes the fighting was brutal, but other times it was hilarious. 
At one point, early in his career with the Reketes, his unit accidentally performed a cavalry charge against a herd of goats. Don Quixote would be proud. But the truth is, he got into so much fighting that to pick any single engagement from his memoir wouldn't do it justice, so you should just go read it. I promise that you'll love it. In large part because it's hilarious. Kemp recognized that a lot of his adventures and misadventures were really quite funny. The man has a great sense of humor, and a talent for anecdotes. Nothing but the worst wounds and tragedies could get his spirit down. And even then, he'd never dwell on it and do everything he could to return to his good humor. This is totally unlike homage to Catalonia, wherein George Orwell is extremely unlikable. He constantly makes awful decisions, and endlessly whines about the things that happen to him as a result. You know, the consequences of his own actions. Hell, Peter Kemp made friends pretty much everywhere he went, while Orwell mostly seemed to make enemies. So after reading all of Orwell's incessant whining, you can just imagine my catharsis when he gets himself shot through the throat. This was actually a serious injury, and Orwell was lucky to survive it. Although how much he deserved to is up to you. Because at the very beginning of his memoir, Orwell says something that raises some red flags. Both sides of the Spanish Civil War committed atrocities. Orwell begins his memoir by describing what Barcelona looked like after being ravaged by the Revolution. We're talking about mass poverty, looted churches, stolen land and wealth, and civilians murdered for no reason other than their social class. All of this is highly illegal. You're not allowed to loot churches during war, and you're definitely not allowed to rob and murder civilians no matter how much you dislike them. But instead of being disgusted by all of this, on just the fourth page, Orwell declares, There was much in it that I did not understand. In some ways, I did not even like it, but I recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Kemp was also a witness to atrocities, not just those of his own troops, but of the enemy. Unlike Orwell, he had the far healthier response of being disgusted by it. The thing that he found most appalling was the treatment of international prisoners. More specifically, their immediate executions. Kemp made an effort to end the policy, at least in his own unit. During his service with the Foreign Legion, he approached his commander, Cancella, and asked where the policy came from. Cancella knew where this was going, and told him, Look, Peter, it's all very well for you to talk about international law and the rights of prisoners. You're not a Spaniard. You haven't seen your country devastated, your family and friends murdered in a civil war that would have ended 18 months ago but for the intervention of foreigners. You know as well as I do that this war would have been over by the end of 1936, when we were at the gates of Madrid but for the international brigades. At that time, we had no foreign help. What is it to us if they have their ideals? Whether they know it or not, they are tools of the communists, and have come to destroy our country. What do they care about the ruin they've made here? Why then should we bother about their lives when we catch them? It'll take years to put right the harm they've done to Spain." Cancella then goes on to say, "...what do you think would happen to you if you were taken prisoner by the Reds? You'd be lucky if they only shot you." That was true. The Republicans also executed foreign volunteers. But the story doesn't end there. The very next day, Kemp caught a deserter from the Republicans, an Irishman from Belfast. The man explained to Kemp that he got stranded in Spain after a ship left him drunk in port, and that he was impressed against his will into the international brigades. This was probably a lie, but Kemp still didn't think it was right to execute him. The very same Cancella who had lectured him the previous day was actually sympathetic to the idea of letting the deserter live, but told Kemp that he needed authorization from their colonel first. Kemp found the colonel eating a plate of fried eggs, saluted, and made the best case he could for the Irishman. The colonel didn't even look up from his plate when he told Kemp that the man had to die, and that Kemp himself was going to be the one to do it. Kemp was shocked. The colonel noticed this, and then screamed at Kemp to leave and shoot the man. As Kemp walked back, he noticed that he was being followed by two of the colonel's men. He broke the news to the deserter, and asked if he had any last wishes. A priest, perhaps. The man just told Kemp that he wanted it to be quick. Kemp and his men executed him as painlessly and honorably as possible. Kemp then made his report to Cancella, but by that time, Cancella had received a message for Kemp from their commandant. The commandant told them that the execution didn't actually have to happen, and that responsibility for it could only fall on the conscience of the colonel who had ordered it. Cancella then told Kemp that the two soldiers who tailed him were ordered by the colonel to shoot him if he didn't go through with the execution. Cancella and the whole unit were truly sorry that this had happened. Kemp excused himself, and processed what he'd just done. 
Kemp would continue to fight for the Nationalists until he was seriously wounded by a grenade, taking him out of action for the rest of the war. He used the connections he had made while active to get access to Francisco Franco, whose permission was needed to leave for England. Not only did Franco let him go, but he invited Kemp to a private meeting. Kemp, of course, accepted. They discussed several things together, particularly Franco's admiration for England. He then asked Kemp what he planned to do after he returned home. Kemp answered that he'd probably join the British Army. He believed that there was going to be a war against Germany. Franco commented that he didn't think there was going to be a war, but Kemp thought he was lying. As it would turn out, Kemp got his war. Orwell's story does not end as happily. Not because anything particularly bad happens to him, but because he just wouldn't let himself be happy. Due to leftist infighting-related reasons, his POUM militia was destroyed by the Stalinists. He could have avoided the effects of this by transferring over to a different unit, but chose not to because he thought it would be more principled or something. Anyway, since the Stalinists were hunting down the survivors of the POUM, Orwell was forced out of the country, escaping over the border into France. He spent a lot of his time there in a small border town that happened to be pro-nationalist. There, he frequented a café. So did Orwell take this opportunity to reminisce about his experience in Spain? Did he quietly relax in the first safe place he's been to in months? Does he realize that he's a terrible decision maker and should never take his life into his own hands again? Of course not! Instead, he eyes the man serving him and thinks, I bet my waiter's a f fascist. And that's homage to Catalonia versus Mine Were of Trouble. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, and PayPal. Links to all of which can be found below. Up next, we're going to talk about a different civil war. One of a more Slavic variety. I'll see you then.